And I would like to invite you to open your Bible to John chapter 14. It's page 1068 in your worship center Bible. We are concluding our winter series, The Spirit-Filled Life, today. And I'm sure now that the winter series is over, the sun's going to break out, the spring will arrive, right? Maybe we shouldn't hold our breath on that. But I would like to work from this passage today as we conclude our series. John chapter 14, we're going to pick up in verse 15 where Jesus is talking to his disciples. Follow along as I read. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Last summer, uh, during my study focus, I uh, determined that if we're going to connect with Christ as a church family, we absolutely must deal with the central issue, which is the Holy Spirit and the Spirit-filled life. Mm -hmm. And I can say that there was this sort of uh, holy discontent in me, I guess, for what seemed to be the popular message of the American church. It sounds something like this. Life is confusing. People are broken. Nobody's perfect. God understands. And there is truth in each one of those sh short sentences, but that is not the high bar of God's church. God not only meets us where we are, God meets us where we are, and then He sets the high bar up on the moon as it were. We talked about that in this series. I mean, the expectation of transformation is so far up there for God's people that none of us could ever reach it on our own. And that's the thing. God is not trying to get you and me to do the best that we can. He's offering to take the whole responsibility on Himself. He's offering to live His life in and through you. For a few years during uh, high school, my daughter Olivia took art lessons from uh, Terry Olson. Terry is an accomplished artist in multiple mediums here at Mac. And it was just amazing to see uh, Olivia's progress over the course of years. She literally went from uh, stick figures to what I consider to be admirable works of art. But then because uh, Olivia went off to college, the art lessons had to stop. But imagine if, if Terry Olson, the master artist, were to live in Olivia. What would her paintings look like then? Well, oh man, that would be a that would be a whole new level of ability. Terry's work would start coming through in Olivia's personality. See, here's the deal. Jesus says to his disciples, "Our time together is coming to an end. I'm not going to be with you anymore." And they were deeply grieved by that. But Jesus says, hear me out. I'm not going to be with you anymore because I'm going to be in you. 
by my Holy Spirit. And in the weeks and months to, to follow, those disciples came to discover just how powerful it was to have Jesus in them by his Holy Spirit, flowing through their own personalities. Suddenly they were able to put to bed their frequent arguments about who was the greatest. Their constant competition with each other was replaced by true self-sacrifice for one another. I mean, they had power that they previously did not have. And I'm sure they never got used to it. In these uh, winter months here at Mac, we've been walking through the Scriptures to try and see what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And early on, uh, we rallied around this sentence. And we'll put it up on the screen now so you can see it. The Spirit-filled life is the relational journey of love toward absolute union with Christ. Where do we get such an idea as that? Well, actually, it's all over the New Testament, but it's right here in this passage that we looked at today. John 14, verse 20. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That's about as close to united as it's going to get. I am in my Father. You are in me. I am in you. Perfect union. And that's what the Spirit-filled life is. And we've been thinking of, uh, of it as this journey of love toward union with Christ. And I likened our walk with Christ to the progressive phases of a love relationship. Some of you may remember that. We talked about it initially as the romance phase. If you've ever fallen in love, you, uh, you saw this person, you got to know them a little bit, your heart was captured. Quickly there was chemistry. It felt good to know that they were interested in you. It felt good to talk to them. It felt good to be known by them. It felt good to be touched by them. And you could be with them for just hours on end. And, I mean, if they, if they ever got on your nerves for any reason, you could just always just go home, right? <laughs> well, the Spirit-filled life begins with a romance phase. And it's this falling in love with Jesus. God opens your eyes to who Jesus is and your, and your heart is captured. It feels good to know that God sent Jesus for you. It feels good to be desired by Him. It feels good to be known by Him and still loved. It feels so good to finally say it. I love you, Jesus. I want you and I trust you. And in turn, he sends his Holy Spirit to live in you. And it's the beginning of the next phase, what I call the marriage phase. Now that I've expressed my love for Jesus and I've formalized my commitment to him, together we enter this new season where he starts to identify some areas in my life that need to change. And no longer can I just go home. I am home. I'm married to Christ. And it's just like in marriage, in the marriage phase of a love relationship, I'm confronted with not so much the weaknesses of my spouse as I am with the truth about myself. And for sure, what I see and, and what I say is all about what's wrong with my spouse. But ever so gradually, I'm, I'm confronted with me. I am primarily selfish. It's all about me. And it's how I feel and how I want things to be and what my spouse is not doing for me. And what starts happening is that by interacting with my spouse, 
like an HD TV, it highlights my greatest flaws. Impatient, unkind, unforgiving, bitter, disengaged, disrespectful, withholding love. But for the married couple that stays on the journey, this is, a, this is actually a wonderful discovery. The truth about myself. And the Spirit-filled life has a marriage phase. And it's, it's a wonderful discovery on the way to union with Christ. The Spirit highlights what needs to be addressed. The Spirit of God starts to bring things to the front in my life. And it's no fun to see these things, but uh, you are on the verge of, of something great through confession and through a humble heart, through the renouncing of sins, you are nearing a more intimate union with the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the last phase of a growing love relationship is what we call the union phase. And it's simply the maturing of love. It's when there are still clearly two distinct people with two distinct personalities, but now there is only one will. It's when what drives me is what's good for you. And what drives you is what's good for me. And that's the highest expression of love in the Spirit-filled life. It's the will of each to seek the good of the other for the sake of the Father and His purposes. That is perfect union. I am in my Father. You are in me. And I am in you. And I don't know which of these phases you may be in. I do know that each phase is a good phase to be in. But the Spirit-filled life is aimed at this union with Christ. And to get there is this maturing of love. Again, in John chapter 14, verse 15, our passage today, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my command. A few verses later, he says the same thing in a little bit of a different way. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. And so the path to the Spirit-filled life is obedience. And every one of us knows that we, do, we don't always obey, right? We sometimes want to go our own way. We say, Lord, I don't care what you say. I'm going my own way. And that takes all kinds of different looks, doesn't it? This week I was looking at the various lists in Scripture that, that outlined the various sins. Interesting that in the church we don't spend too much time in those lists. But this week I looked at those various lists of sin to examine my own heart. And I want to take just a few moments this morning to walk through uh, a summary of some of those sins. And I want to ask you today, are any of these present in your life? The Holy Spirit's able to reveal that to you. Evil thoughts. Scripture mentions evil thoughts as sin. We imagine that what's going on in our head, no one knows about. Evil thoughts. Sexual immorality. Whether it be adultery or fornication, which is sexual relations between unmarried people. Theft. Stealing from your employer. Murder. There is murder 
physically, but Jesus says that on par with physical murder is simply hating your brother. Murder is on par with hating your brother. Greed. Malice, which is the desire to do harm to someone. Deceit. Envy, which is ill feeling because of the good that's happening to someone else. Slander, which is false statements about someone or, or gossip or, or criticizing. And then you have arrogance and folly. Folly is just a lapse from moral standards. Unwholesome talk. Scripture says unwholesome talk is sin. Swearing, cursing, profanity, words that don't build up. Another, bitterness, which can be grudges or resentment in the heart. Another is rage, which is anger that takes the form of violence toward another. Lust of the eyes, discord, drunkenness, and the list could go on and on and on. But the Spirit is able to reveal these things in your life and in mine. Spirit-filled life is not possible with these sins present. Let me say that again. The Spirit-filled life is not possible with these sins present in your life. challenge is that when these things are present in our lives, there is this bent in us to just want to move on. Just, let's just get on with it. Let's put that in the past. I, I told you I'm sorry. What more do you want? And that never works in a love relationship, does it? If you've ever tried that, that didn't go well for you. I told you I'm sorry. What more do you want? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11 makes this comparison between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Listen to this. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern and readiness to see justice done. Those uh, two verses have a very specific context, but it's very clear here that worldly sorrow is all about damage control. I said, I'm sorry. What more do you want from me? But godly sorrow, godly sorrow feels the burden of sin and it's ready to confess regardless of consequences. 1 John 1 9, which is written to believers, reads If we confess our sins, and I just want to stop there for a moment. And note that it does not say if we confess that we have sinned. That is not what we're to confess. We're not to confess that we have sinned. It says if we confess our sins. Giving them a name. Identifying what it is that we did to turn our back on God. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What breaks connection with the Spirit? Sin in our lives. What restores fellowship? Confession. Godly sorrow, which leads to repentance. 
And I'll, let me just say, too, that when you confess, you're not saying that from here on out you're going to get it right. That's not what you're saying. You, you don't triumph over sin on your own. You simply reckon it to be true that Christ has already triumphed and therein is your power to walk in obedience. He's already triumphed. Now that I've reckoned that to be true, I can walk in obedience. And I love that promise in verse 21 of our passage today. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I too will love him and will show myself to him. Oh, there's the ticket. To have Christ show himself to you. That changes everything. A revelation of Christ, a glimpse of Christ in your life will change everything in your life. And I want that for you. I want you to not walk on in your life as if the things that have taken place in it don't matter. I want you to have a clean slate before the Lord because you dealt with it with godly sorrow. Will you uh, bow your head with me now? And We have... Uh, determined to create some space in our service for the balance of our time together. There's going to be a few songs that we're going to uh, sing. But this first one, I invite you just to be silent. Just pray. Ask God to reveal what He wants you to see in your life. Ask God to give you a willing spirit to confess what He touches in your life and what He reveals to you. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. Your Word is sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts to the core. Even this morning, Lord, as we listen, Your Word is speaking to us. And Father, we ask that in these next moments You would continue to point out in our lives what You want us to see, what You want us to confess, and the name You want us to give it. And Father, we pray that as we confess, we would experience the rich sweetness of being wrapped up by your love. You are not a grudge-holding God. You sent your Son for us while we were yet sinners. But God, we want to enjoy sweet fellowship with you. We want to enjoy that connection with you that comes only as we are pure before you. Meet us, Lord, in these next moments. Amen. Amen.